David Spada is a successful attorney whose dream was to become a sports talk show host. Elliot Harris is a Chicago sports columnist who wanted to expand his media presence. In the next hour, they combine their talents and love of sports and women by interviewing former professional athletes and lovely ladies on sports and torts. But keeping the boys out of trouble isn't always easy because when David and Elliot are together, they have more fun than should be legal. Elliot, we're going to have a great show today, I have a feeling. You think? I think so. No girls, but we're going to have on two former Green Bay Packers, one in the Hall of Fame. I was going to say, you were almost going to say Pro Football Hall of Famers, and you might be getting just a little bit ahead of yourself. I have a feeling this other guy's going to go in. He deserves to go in. But again, we're going to have on Herb Adderley and Dave Robinson, two guys who I never saw play, but I heard great things about them. I did, and and Dave Robinson should be in the Hall of Fame. People who can remember, people who've seen footage of those Packer teams from the 60s, can attest to Dave Robinson about it, as good as there was in the NFL in those days. Let's get right to the interview we taped with Dave Robinson and Herb Adderley. So who did the bulk of the writing? You or uh, Herb, Dave? Herb. Hey, I'll tell you, listen, I'm going to tell you, when you're talking to one person, and Herb Adderley, who has done more, seen more, and been involved in more than anybody I know. He, he's a, just a great individual. He's got the heart the size of, of the Grand Canyon. He, he helps do anything with people. Got himself in trouble trying to help with the rest of the league. I mean, you can't, I can't say enough superiorities about Herb Adderley. I tell you, I, I call him brother because I, I had some brothers, and I feel Herb, just like I feel close to Herb, but did to my own brothers. Cause he, he's a really great guy. So, Dave, what, what did you do with the book then? If Herb's what doing, I do? Yeah, if Herb's doing all the writing. Well, I got a couple chapters in there, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah my, my life wasn't quite as exciting, but it was. It was a good life. I, I tell you what, I wouldn't change it for all, all the money in the world. Wait, take that back. I wouldn't change it for one fourth of all the money in the world. <laughs> so, what's what's the name of the book for our listeners? It's called well, Lombardi's the Left Side. The left side, and we had to give Roy yeah. Boyle some credit too because he's also a co-author right. and he put everything together for us. So, the book is the Left Side, and the book came about because uh, I wanted to do a book alone and call it the Left Corner because that's my position, and then I started thinking, well, I didn't do it alone, so I approached Dave and Willie Davis, because without them, I wouldn't have been successful on the left side. The defensive end and the linebacker meant more to me, along with Willie Wood, the great free safety, than anybody on the team. So I went to both Dave and Willie and with my idea of doing the book and calling it the left side, and they both agreed, but for some reason, Willie Davis decided to drop out and do his own book. So I told Dave, let's roll without him. And that's how it all came about. So Dave, who ended up with the better book, do you think? Would we do, be uh, Willie and us? And Willie and Herb and I? Yeah. You, you guys, I, well, you guys I, I, are I'm really... I'm biased, I'm I'm biased. And, and I think, really, if you're going you're gonna to buy one, I'd buy the left side. The big thing that what, what Herb is saying is, is that, uh, you know, we, we were always together, everything. And uh, Bruce Boyles, by the way, Bruce Boyles and I have written a book together. So Bruce did a lot of writing. He, took, he did a lot of interviews and, this, and put it down. He, would, he transcribed things and wrote it down. Uh, but uh, So we worked with Bruce. I worked with Bruce before. And that's one reason. That's how Bruce got involved. And he was a godsend to us. He helped us a lot, quite a bit. But Willie Davis's book is, uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about it, but it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the pizzazz that's in the left side. It doesn't have the, I hate to say it, but controversy. It doesn't have a, the insight that you're going to get for reading the left side. The, the insight about uh, more than one team. Herb Alley played for Green Bay and for the, the Dallas Cowboys. And what's interesting there is that Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry coached together in 1958. 1959, Lombardi went to Green Bay, small northern town with no whites in it, no blacks in it, excuse me. And Landry went to a in 1960, the next year, I went to Dallas, a large southern town with uh, a very few blacks on the team. And uh, they both had, and this is during the turbulent 60s, and we touch on that, how, how the 60s changed and how each of the two coaches handled it and, and whether, or not, whether or not the way they handled it led to championships or not. You have to read the book to get the answer, but I think you can guess. <laughs> Dave, you know what I found surprising? We interviewed Sam Huff last year, 
and Sam was on their 58 team that played against the Colts in the Super Bowl and lost. And he said— It wasn't well, a Super Bowl then. I mean, the, champi- the championship game. <laughs> and, what, and what he said was, we had a great offensive coordinator and a great defensive coordinator in Lombardi and Landry. And what do the Giants do when they need a new coach? They hire another an assistant coach, and they let two future Hall of Famers go. And it's just truly amazing that the Giants owner, the Mirrors, could be that dumb. Well, they, they hired Alex Sherman, you know, and, and they say that uh, uh, Lombardi, you know, applied for the job, but they, for some reason, you know, bypassed him and decided to hire Alex Sherman and said, okay, we'll get Lombardi a job in Siberia. That's what they called Green Bay at the time. And sent him up to Green Bay. I think they had only won maybe one or two games previous to Lombardi getting there. You know, in the other book, we interviewed a Vince Jr., he said that Walter Meyer and Vince were very close. I always got together every time they went to the, in the New York. But Walter Meyer, Marie told me one on one one time that Walter Meyer called Vince in his office and said, Vinny, I know what you're going to do. He says, uh, he says, but I'll tell you what, New York City is not ready for an Italian head coach. So if I were you, I talked like a son, if I were you, take the job in Green Bay. And, and, the, and she said, Vince Val at that time, Never to lose to the New York Giants, and he never did. And that was, and that was the thing. And the other thing is, he talked to Alan Sherman, who was the next head coach, and he was, of course. And then Landry left. And and in that game, Sam Cup's talking about. I don't know how true the story is. I've heard about three or four times from different places. But when they they received the kickoff in overtime, the Giants they ran down the field and it was fourth and one. And Lombardi told Jim Lee Howe, the head coach, he says, "We should go for it." Any good team can make one yard. And Tom Landry said, the odds are against it. We should punt the ball and let my defense hold them. And Vince was adamant that it should, that should go for it. Jim Lee Howe went with Landry. They punted the ball. Johnny Nash got the ball, marched down the field, scored, and beat him. And Lombardi always felt that he was right. Now, you flash ahead another, what, 18, 19 years. And all of a sudden, in 1967, January 31st, we're on the one-yard line, third and goal. 16 seconds to go on the game. We call timeout. Lombardi goes in and tells the watch star to go for it. Across the field, Tom Landry, the guys from Dallas told me, uh, Mel Renford, those guys said, Tom Landry told them, play the outside. The only play they can run is a bootleg or a pitch out uh, or option. Play. So they got something where they can throw the ball to kill the clock. And, so, and uh, some of the, deep, the defensive guys from Dallas were playing to the outside, soft, which made our but the block a lot easier in Temple Pew, who was trying to get outside to stop a sweep instead of coming right up right the middle. And we, uh, as you know, we made it. And Vince Lombardi felt vindicated at that moment when he got to be beat the Dallas Cowboys up the middle. And that's how it is. Now, it goes back. One of my greatest plays was a year before down in Dallas when they had fourth and two with 52 seconds. And what did he run? He ran a bootleg by top, by, with uh, Don Meredith. And, uh, some situation there, but thank God Meredith was slow enough that caught him and it was no problem. But uh, that's how we that's how we maintain our, our lead of 34-27 and won the game, which let's go to Super Bowl one. So I think Vince was very very happy with those two victories because it proved his point to Tom Landry. Well, you know Landry made a lot of coaching decisions that cost the Cowboys games, not only with his play calling but also with the personnel. Because if you remember, Dave in the Cotton Bowl. In the game you're talking about, Don Perkins was running like Jim Brown. We couldn't stop right. Perkins. Perkins was running inside the tackles. Oh, he didn't come around our side, Dave. He was running inside the tackles, and he got the ball down to the 20-yard line. And all of a sudden, Landry decided to take Perkins out of the game and put Dan Reeves in. And He's Reeves right. had two He's bad right. knees, and I could walk faster than Reeves could run. <laughs> and, Reeves, and, and then all of a sudden, Landry changed his game plan and started throwing mm-hmm. the ball instead of running. If Perkins had stayed there, I'm guarantee you that game would have been tied. We went in overtime. It might have been a different outcome. But because of Landry's yeah. coaching decisions and his personnel moves, it cost them games before I got there, and it cost them games after I got there. I saw it firsthand. Now, Dave, after that Ice Bowl victory, what was Lombardi like in the locker room? <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was, all, it was pure euphoria because, like I said, Vince Lombardi, when I got there in 1963, uh, Vince Lombardi, I just, I've, been, I've been moving around a lot of positions at the All-Star game, at def- defensive end, offensive end, and finally linebacker. When I got there, 
he felt obligated to tell me that the problem was, he says, Phil and I thought you'd be a great linebacker. But he said, we have just won 61 and 62. Our goal is to win three consecutive world championships. No one, had ever, no one has done it since the playoff system was initiated. And he said, I don't want any distractions. And you'll be the first black starting linebacker in the National Football League. So I don't want, we don't want any newspaper articles or anything else. If I asked you about it, Bud Lee did. He said, tell him to see me. I told Bud to see Vincent. That was it. But that's what it was. So when, now when 66, 65, 66, when he won in 67, this was like Vincent's golden life. He won a third consecutive world championship. How would, what, how would you feel if your golden life was to win an Emmy or something from for radio, and all of a sudden you got it not once, not twice, but three years in a row? That's how Vince Lombardi felt about winning three consecutive world championships. And I'll tell you something. We were all so close to our, close to our coach that if he was happy, we were ecstatic. He you did know, a, he did first, a, Go ahead, Herb. The first time that Dave met Lombardi was after the All-Star game when the All-Stars played against the pro champions in Soldier Field. But Dave was on, the cha- on that team that beat us in that game. And Lombardi was livid, man. And Dave had time to take a shower, get dressed, and come over to our locker room. And he was feeling good with a big grin on his face coming in the locker room. And he heard Lombardi chewing us out. We didn't even have time to take our pads and stuff off (laughs) because of Lombardi chewing us out behind that game. And this went on for about 45 minutes. And I don't know what Dave was thinking when he came in there, but that was his first time encounter with Lombardi. (laughs) Herb, Herb, how did you lose to college All-Stars? Were you taking for granted? Or? Oh, oh, well, they had mm. they had some good. They had a good team. They had some some great players, college players on that team. That's right. I don't think we took anybody for granted. It was just a case of them, you know, making some good plays. And uh, I guess you could say they won the game, so maybe they outplayed us. And I remember well, one you know, Pat Richter, who was Dave's <laughs> roommate, uh, he had a big yeah. game, and I think uh, right. Van der Kellen, uh, those guys were from yeah. Wisconsin too. Hmm. You know, one of the things I'll tell you that's from the other side of it, we never thought we stood a chance. They went in the locker room, it was 10, 10 and a half time. But you have to remember that Nisky didn't play at all. They had Urban Henry out there at that defensive end that was kind of weak. Urban Henry was not the greatest defense in the world. And and on top of that, Otto Graham did some things that that, that in the coaching clinic would say never do. Like we went for it on fourth down on our own 30 yard line or something like that. Crazy moves like that. And he could say, but see, everybody expected to lose. And Otto Graham just made calls that were ridiculous calls, and we were lucky enough that they break. And I think half the time we ran the calls, the Packers thought it was going to be a fake. <laughs> we had to play. You know? It was just weird. It's just one of those, it's got to be, everything's got to fall in place for the All-Stars to win. And later, Vince told me, personally, he says, if I could have gotten that All-Star team, the whole team as it was, and kept them together, I could win a championship in three years with them. And I said, I don't know, I just, I had, but no, and after later, but the new Vincent, how many coached him, what he did, I believe him now. I believe him back in, back in 67. I knew that Vince, if he had kept that team together, it was a great team. I mean, guys that that team had started all over the league, uh-huh. and, uh, in both AFL and NFL. And if he could have got them together and train them, I think he could have won a championship with that team. Now, Herb, if Vince Lombardi was so smart, how come it took him a while to get you, you know, out of the back, the offensive backfield and to the defensive backfield? <laughs> Well, he, the only reason I got in the defensive backfield, because when I was drafted out of Michigan State, I was the number one draft choice as a running back, an all-Big Ten running back. But when I got there, obviously Paul Horning, Hall of Famer, Jim Taylor, Hall of Famer, the year before he drafted Tom Moore out of Vanderbilt, number one draft choice of running back. The year I got there, Elijah Pitts came along with me. So we had, you know, four or five running backs. Luke Carpenter was there, four or five or six running backs. And uh, I knew my chances was almost nil. And I played all special teams uh, and played behind Boy Dollar as wide receiver and then running back a little bit too, practicing. But in Detroit, Thanksgiving Day, my rookie year, Hank Grimminger got hurt in the second quarter. And at halftime, Lombardi said, we got an emergency situation and we're going to put our best athlete out to play the left corner. So I'm sitting there on the bench and just thinking about running the kickoff back in the second half. He comes over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, Herb, just do the best you can. So I look at him and I said, who, me? He said, yeah. <laughs> and by that time, everybody was getting up, walking out of the locker room for the second half of the game. I didn't even have time to find my helmet. You know, I was so nervous and everything, I had to go back and get my helmet to take out. So I had no practice, never practiced position, 
and ended up intercepting a pass and setting up the winning touchdown. I guess that's when he thought that I could play uh, defense because I could play both sides of the ball. And I went right back to offense. I never they played another down on defense until the championship game when we beat New York Giants 37 to nothing. The last two minutes, he told me again, he said, go out there for uh, Jesse Whittington. And this was on the right corner. And I intercepted the pass. The only two times I played as a defensive back, I intercepted the pass. So I guess he decided in 62 that he switched me over. You were a smart player, uh, Herb, yeah. because the Bears tried to – make Devin Hester a cornerback, a wide receiver, he still can't <laughs> grasp it. <laughs> well, you know, it takes uh, a lot of athletic ability. You know, I had God give me right. athletic ability, which, you know, I played four sports in high school. Basketball was my favorite sport. So it wasn't any problem for me to make the adjustment. All I had to do was learn how to tackle. Now, Herb. You know, I'll tell you one thing. You mentioned Hester, and he's one great football player, and so is a lot of Muscat playing today. But one thing you got to remember is, that when there was a, there were only 14, 12 teams, went to 14 later on, 12 teams in the league. The, then they, they only took the draft choices and the, the top 20 guys, and they only had like 36 men on the team. My rookie year, they went to 38. So there's only 38 men on per team, only 14 teams. You could take the cream of the crop and get them into the league. Now, now when you got 32 teams and you got 53 men per team, you got to not only take the cream of the crop, you got to go down a little deeper. And the problem is you don't get ball players who are well-rounded, who like Herb did. That played four sports. Herb could have played. He, I think he could have been an all-pro running back or a defensive back. Thank God he was, was my corner. I love that. But that type of ball player is hard to come by now because there's so many specialists. And the guys, they start specializing in high school, and they only know one phase of the game. And as Herb, we played, we in college, we had to go both ways, offense and defense. You had to learn both, both positions. The college kids today, they're either offense or defense. They, some can switch over, but when they do, they have to learn all over again. It was a whole different time, a whole different era. I think it was I think it was a golden age of football, really. I'm just happy to have played during that time. And, and, and I'll tell you, I had the same experience Herb did. When I came up, I was, I was the fourth linebacker, the one, the, the swing man. And so Nisky broke his arm. Like I always tell Nisky, bad break for you, good break for me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I started. And then, and, and that was it. See, it was just, it was just, you just, you know, and it was, it, Green Bay Packers were a great team. I, I, I know I'm talking too long. I'll say one last thing. When I was in college, there was an article in Sports Illustrated by Dan Curry about you how the key in, in pro football. And I read it, and I didn't really understand what key was in college. Because the, mm-hmm. he, I went to Penn State, a great school, but they hadn't really taught me the keys. And I took that book, and I carried it with me for six, seven, eight weeks. I was a Dan Curry idol. I idolized Dan Curry. I walk on the field the first day, and who's who's the starting left linebacker for the Green Bay Packers the team? I got to try and get try to win position with, but Dan Curry. And it's, so that's the thing. That team was so good. So many good ball players. When you came in as a rookie. You knew you had to be able to do everything. And, and one last story. And, and I was going along fine my rookie year. I was number one draft choice, and uh, my wife was home pregnant with twins. And I was laughing one day about how Jerry Kramer, who was kicking off, couldn't get the ball past the 20. And someone told Vince that I kicked off at Penn State. He came to me, put his arm on my shoulder, says, I hear you kicked off at Penn State. I said, yes, sir. He said, why don't you kick it off here? I said, well, coach, I'm, I'm playing a new position, linebacker. I'm supposed to play an offensive defense in college. And I want to practice up hard and study every, my book. And I want to be the best linebacker in the National Football League. And he said, well, son, he says, your best chance to make this team is as a kicker. And I stayed out 45 minutes that night kicking. <laughs> and, I, and I kicked off, cleaned up until the uh, – because uh, Horny was gone that year, so we never kicked off there. And I kicked that into 1964 until I got hurt. But, you know. but that's how it was. There was just great men in every position. And you you just weren't multifaceted. You didn't have more than one talent. You weren't going to make the Green Bay Packers. Now, Herb, how does a Philly guy end up at Michigan State playing for Duffy Doherty? Uh, number one, Clarence Peaks. Was, was like my idol when I was in high school. And uh, I only played two years of football in high school because I played basketball, like I said, it was my favorite sport. Ended up playing football for a couple of years. And my high school coach said, hey, look, you're going to have the ability to go to the big-time school and maybe get yourself a scholarship. And he started asking me during my senior year where I want to go. And I told him about Clarence Peaks in Michigan State. So he said, well, look, 
uh, I know Duffy Doherty. He knew Duffy from some coaching clinics and stuff that they were having around the country. And he says, the only thing I can do is give him a call and let him know I got a blue chip ball player and see what he said. And that's how the whole thing started. I wanted to go to Michigan State because of Clarence Peak, and that's where the number 26 originated. You know, he was my idol. When I got there, he met me at the airport, showed me around. He was a senior going out. In fact, he was the number one draft choice of the Philadelphia Eagles in my hometown. So when I got to Michigan State, for some reason, they gave me 26 and said, hey, if you can emulate Clarence Speaks, he said, you're going to be a, a, a great player. And that's how the whole thing started. And how I got to Michigan State, I went on as a walk-on. I had to make the team. I didn't get a scholarship. Dave, you mentioned that you were the first black starting linebacker in the NFL. I never realized outside, that. Outside, outside linebacker. Outside linebacker. Outside linebacker, yeah. Because Willie well, Lanier was... There was none on the inside either, Willie. There was none inside either. In the AFL I had some, but there was none in the NFL. Right, because... And I, Willie Lanier was younger than me. He came in after I did. Right, Willie Lanier was the first starting middle linebacker. Right. Was that hard, or what was the reason? Did they think that black athletes weren't smart enough to play linebacker? Exactly right. That was a, that was a, that was the boys of the time. That's what they thought. And the, and the, and now Bobby Bell and I get the same year. He was went to the other league. Of course, Bobby did. He went to the AFL. See, the AFL was a funny league. The AFL brought more black ball players in because I I, I'm, I don't I don't necessarily believe it's true, but the NFL had sucked up all the cream of the crop, all the good white ball players in the country, just about. And the only white ball players they were getting in the AFL were guys who had played out the their career was over, guys who were cut by the NFL team when they pick off off the cut list. But the black ball player, that whole that whole traditional black college university, all the leagues down the south, the Grambling, the, the Florida A and M's and the North Carolina and, and, and all those schools, that was on tap talent. And the AFL who needed ball players badly, they went down and got that. And so they were really the pioneers in, in fully integrating the, the, the game of football. And uh, that, but there were none in the NFL. And eventually one of did my biggest issue. I'll tell you one thing else. I'll tell you Herb Chase is the first round draft choice. And I was the first round draft choice. Herb Alley was the first black African American man to be drafted in the first round by the Green Bay Packers ever. And I was the second. And that that shows how the how things have changed. Now and, and it, now it, it, well it's just so different. You know, I'm, everybody knows how how the league is now. You know, but. It was it was amazing, you know. Now, Herb, what was the transition like, having grown up in Philadelphia, going to Michigan State, and finding yourself in Green Bay, Wisconsin? Well, uh, number one, I went to all integrated schools in Philly: elementary school, Fittler Elementary School. It was all integrated, black and white, Chinese, you name it, Asian. I went to Roosevelt Junior High School. It was the same way: uh, integrated, uh, boys, white girls. Black girls, boys and girls, never any problems. And then I attended an all-boys high school in Philly, Northeast High School. And we had a variety of ethnic groups, Asians. We had Ukrainians on the soccer team, uh, black, white. There were more white players on the football team than black. Uh, basketball was black and white. So I had no problem them going to Michigan State. Michigan State had probably more black All-Americans than any school in the country. I know most schools in the Big Ten. I mean, it had Don Coleman, Clarence Peaks, Leroy Bolden, just to name a few, uh, Ellis Duckett, uh, uh, Jim Ellis. All these guys were all American, and they had a chance to play because Michigan State didn't go for no, you know, segregation. They wanted to play the best ball players. Bubba Smith later on. Well, Bubba Smith was after me. He came. Yeah, Bubba was, uh, I think, '65. They had three guys on there with number one draft choices: Gene Washington, Bubba Smith, and Clinton Jones, and George Webster. So they had four guys number yeah. one choices on that team. But anyway, you know, getting there, and the first time I experienced uh, segregation, really, after coming out of Philly, was in East Lansing, Michigan, because they didn't allow black people to live in East Lansing. All the black people that lived off campus had to live 10 miles down the road in Lansing, which is the state capital. And that included the professors at Michigan State University also. So in, I think it was like 1959, the NAACP started picketing and everything, but eventually it got to be okay. So my senior year, I lived uh, right on the street, Grand River Avenue, where in East Lansing, where the school's located. So things changed. Now I get to Green Bay, it's all white town, you know, so it wasn't no really big deal because that's the way East Lansing was when I got there. And it was fewer people in East Lansing than the 68,000 people in Green Bay. So I really didn't have to make no adjustment because uh, small town blues didn't get me coming from Philly with millions of people then going to East Lansing with small town. 
So Green Bay was easy for me to make the adjustment. How, what sort of social life could you have, though? Well, it wasn't any social life at all in Green Bay. You know, the social life in, in Mich- at Michigan State, because they had, you know, uh, quite a few black co-eds, so it wasn't any problem. But in Green Bay, you know, being single, well, the social life was just socializing with the guys or, you know, just going out to Speeds or the Tropicana or my brother's place and having a Budweiser or whatever your adult the beverage of your choice. And uh, we had to drive 112 miles to get a haircut to Milwaukee because nobody didn't allow any facial hair or long hair, black or white. So, you know, we had to keep ourselves, uh, you know, in, in good physical shape and uh, looking well and wore suit and tie on the road all the time. And uh, that's where it was. Were you guys basically warned or advised to stay away from the white women? No, nobody ever said anything to me about that. And uh, obviously, you know, being out and around, in restaurants or wherever with a small town, well, you know, people are going to come over and say hello, asking for autographs and so forth and so on. So no one ever came to me and said, uh, you know, we don't want you dating white women, we don't want you talking to white women. That never happened the whole time I was there for nine years. You know what, uh, the, you know, when you said, ask that question, you didn't understand, I think, understand Vince Lombardi. It was just almost the opposite situation. Uh, my roommate, was my roommate, Lana Aldrich, had come from Utah State, at Utah State, he started dating a Mormon girl who happened to be white, of course. All Mormons are white in those days. And <laughs> they were dating, and they were dating, and they and uh, they wanted to get married. Her family was going to disinherit her, everything else. And the word got out that uh, he and her wanted to get married. No, what happened was if someone called. Or, it, see, the players never give us a hard time, but usually the wives of players. And one of them got back to Vince that, Vince, that he was bringing this white woman to Green Bay and cohabitating with her. And Vince called him in. Lionel said, Vince called him in. He asked him, he said, what's your intentions? He said, I'd like to marry her. He said, well, then marry her. Make her, make her an honest woman of her. He said, well, I don't know if you've ever read the Cookie Gilchrist story. True or not, the rumor that when all black ball players in the league heard about Cookie Gilchrist was a great running back. But he was dating a white girl, married to her, I'm not sure what it was. And he was blackballed out of the league, had to go to Canada where he played his best football. But even in his later years when he came back with the Buffalo Bills, he was still good enough to make an all AFL team. And he said, I'm, I don't want to get blackballed. And Vince told him, he said, well, you marry her and make an honest woman out of her. I'll, let me take care of that. And that's when they said, in our, in our first book, Vicky tells the story that that uh, Pete Rozelle came all the way to Green Bay to tell Vince, do not let this happen. Do not let, the, there were no white black marriage he thought in the league. And uh, and Vince told Pete Rozelle, he said, you run the NFL and I run the, and I run the Green Bay Packers. And Lionel and Vicky were married. And uh, we, for the book, was trying to research if there were any other black-white marriages. And we think there were some. But nobody who was married to a white woman, and knew, no matter what the team, brought his wife to camp. So he, there was just... You have to understand, we're talking about pre-civil rights. The Civil Rights Act was 1964. But Herb's talking about you couldn't stay places. People denied you rooms in Green Bay. They were perfectly legal. They were in their rights. People denied you service in a bar or restaurant. They were in their rights. Uh-huh. Well, they're not breaking the law. You have, to, you have to live during that time and understand what's going on. It sounds harsh when you're living in 2012, but when you're living in 1963, like I was in 64, because the Civil Rights Act, even though it was signed in 64, the, the, it didn't take effect in 1968. And, and so you've got to understand it. And then we did. <laughs> and and that, that was the whole thing. So Vince Lombardi would not take any, any kind of guff. He would, he would, Vince would react the same way if he had a, a, a white wife or or, or, or they would anybody else, it, it, you know, it didn't make it just events. Okay. Well, his, his, he had a zero tolerance for racism, and he felt right. as though any type of discrimination was wrong. Now, Pete Rozelle, you know, it was none of his business as to who Lionel or who anybody else was going to marry. And to me, it was like a, a racism thing for him to come in and try to stop something like that. At the mm-hmm. same yeah. time, Roselle knew that there was racism going on in the NFL that he did nothing about. For example, the Washington Redskins and the St. Louis Cardinals had no black players at all. There was racism going on on every team because Jim Crow was alive and well, still is, and they had an unwritten quota for black players during the 50s and the 60s. There was no more than three, four, maybe five black players on each team in the NFL, 
And that's why most of the black players started going to the AFL back in the day because they wasn't being drafted by the NFL. Roselle knew that there was racism going on in the locker room with the Dallas Cowboys because Tex Small was a great writer for Sports Illustrated. August the, August 31st, 1970, before I got traded to Dallas, there was an article by Tex Small about the racism in Big D, and he talked about what was going on. So I'm saying to myself, this guy has to have an inside contact for him to mention that there were white players on the Dallas Cowboys who outright came out and said they didn't want to play with black players, and there was a lot of dissension because of the racism that was going on in the locker room between the black and white players, which was unheard of in Green Bay. And I had to face that before I got traded. I knew it was some racism and the stuff was going on in Dallas. And it was totally a different culture, a different locker room, a different coaching aspect. And Landry never said nothing about it, never helped us to get housing. Uh, I had to move on the south side where all the black folks stayed. Uh, Lombardi said, we're going to do something about it and help us to get housing. Because in 1961, we couldn't live in the city of Green Bay. We all had to live outside in the suburbs, to Peel, Ashwabanam, uh, little small towns, because of uh, the Fair Housing Act hadn't been passed, which you just talked about, Dave, in 1964, 65, with LBJ. But Herb, didn't Dallas have Bob Hayes and uh, Kelvin Hill? When I got there? Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, a race field right, uh, offensive uh, lineman. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got there on defense, Mel Renfro, Cornell Green, uh, and uh, that was it. On the, on the defense Pugh was there side. too. And Jethro Pugh, they had three black yeah. guys on defense. When Green Bay, we had seven on defense. So in Dallas, they moved me to the corner, put Cornell Green at strong safety. Bell Renfro would have been the greatest free safety of all time because of his speed, his athletic ability to play free safety and to help the cornerbacks. But Landry didn't want Mel playing free safety because he wanted Charlie Waters or Cliff Harris, two white guys, to play in there to free safety. Now, Mark Washington was drafted out of Morgan State. Mark was a great athlete, and he was a natural cornerback. Mark could have played the right corner with the help of me, Carnell, and Mel and we would have had four black guys for the first time in the history in the NFL secondary, but Landry didn't want to get that in his legacy. He didn't want no parts of that. So in other words, Landry didn't want to put the best players on the field. You know, and I think that it was uh, he made the choices because uh, the color of the skin rather than uh, the contest of the character and athletic ability, and it cost him some games before I got there, and it cost him games you know, while I was there. Well, down you know, there, they would have shot... They would have they would have shot Landry down there. Who were there? The Cowboys down there. The real Cowboys would have shot Landry if he did that, wouldn't they? Oh, man. They, I don't know what they would have done to him. <laughs> I do one thing. Uh, the President of the United States got shot down there and killed. So, you know, <laughs> no telling what might happen. Yeah. And they were you know, I'll tell you what. One thing I want to say is that I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to stop her, but a lot of this stuff is covered in our books. You want to read, you buy the book, The Left Side. You're going to hear the real skinny and some of these stories that what's going on, what went on in Dallas, what it was like. And it's, uh, it's I just, I like to just give you a little snippet so you buy the book. It's, but I, Herb hasn't told anything that I disagree with yet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, here's a story I heard. I heard a lot of, there's a lot of stories going around and what's true or not. You, you, I, I don't like to say it's true because I can't prove it. But when Vince got the grievance in 1959, there were only two African Americans on the team and they were banned from going to certain bars and restaurants in the city of Green Bay. And the story I heard was the owners of all those bars were inviting the Vince's office. They sat down and he pleaded a case, which is a typical case about, you know, we don't mind, it's my customers don't want to do it, blah, 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 blah. And what Vince was supposed to report to him said, listen, you bought, worked, earned those places, you, they're your places. You can serve or not serve anybody you want to. That's the American race. Right, that's the American race. In fact, I'll go to war to defend your rights to deny service to anybody you want to. And you have my word that as of this day, no black Green Bay Packers will be in any of your establishment. As a matter of fact, neither will any white players be there because you're off limits. And the people, that, and I heard the guy say, oh, 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 you, you can't do that. It kills we can't have any ball players in our establishment. Uh -huh. You can't do it. I, I just did. And, and uh, so what happened, as the story I heard was, the whole town instantly became integrated. This is before Herb got there, 
the incident they start allowing the black ball players to go where they went in Green Bay restaurants or bars or anything else. And you know what? The, the thing I admire most about Vince Lombardi, there was no big paper, no big band, no no no. Uh, NWCP has to come in and march. Or, no no uh, equivalent to a Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton coming in with great speeches. One man, very quietly, in a room with seven or eight uh, uh, bar and restaurant owners, sort of integrated the whole city of Green Bay in a matter of minutes. That's the type. That's the giant in this society. This, this is why he's a great football coach. He was a a better than average football player. But his influence on that city, his influence on the National Football League, and consequently his influence on America, uh-huh. far more than anybody, than far more than people realize. You know, I, I, uh, I, I think the world, I think the world is the body. I really do. Now, Dave, you're from New Jersey. Correct. How, how different was Green Bay from Mount Holly Township where you grew up? I, Burlington, I, I, I grew up in Mount Laurel Township. Where the NFL films today, and this in Brown County. The difference in Green Bay and where I grew up is uh, the, the, the big state in the old term, the difference is night and day. When I had the first time I got the, uh, my wife came up with me, and uh, we had got a little part, we rented a house, two bedroom house, had two bedrooms, a living room, kitchen, and a bathroom. That's it. And it was, wasn't much of a house. And, the, my, and my landlord told me, he says, I know it's not much of a house, he said, but it's probably a lot better than what you have to live in back in New Jersey. Every part, that's what I realized. People in Wisconsin didn't understand. They thought that every black person in America, Philadelphia, New Jersey, and East Coast, lived in the roach-infested, eating paint off the walls they saw in the in the newsreel. We all lived in ghettos. And I told him, Frank, Frank Pagan says, uh, you know what I said? Neither me nor my friends in New Jersey will live in your house. <laughs> and he, he, he was offended by it until my wife took pictures and showed him where we lived in our neighborhood. They didn't, the people, it, they weren't, I don't say that they're biased. I think they were un, un, uninformed. They truly felt because of the news reports they saw, there's no black TV shows or anything, no, no Cosby show or anything. They truly felt that every black person in the East in America lived in some form of a ghetto. And, and, the, and as you know, it was never right. No, I mean, black culture back in those days was Amos and Andy. That's what they thought it was. That's, that's it. That's exactly right. And and, and that, that was what, that's what the people in Green Bay felt. And, and I don't blame, I, I have no ill feel, will towards the people. I know they, they weren't informed, but, you know, that was what it was. And I I, I got one house one year because the lady, the lady had an argument with the next door neighbor. She said, I'll get even with you. I'll rent the black. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I wasn't the first which ran this another guy. I think it was Willie Wood. And then and then Willie didn't want the house, and it was just right for my family. I had, I had three children, and we moved into it. And uh, she became a real good friend, and she told us the story herself many times. And she she just never knew. She said she she just apologized in that way, and that was just it. But she really did it because she was mad at the neighbors. That, that, that was the way it was. Herb, and, you know, how. You made the comment about uh, Tony Dorsett in the book, The Left End, you guys wrote that he was, as the media says, racist. Have former Cowboy players basically come after you and said he doesn't know what he's talking about? Uh, Dave just mentioned about Bill Cosby and the Cosby show. I just want to say one thing. Bill Cosby and Cosby and I grew up together in Philly, and he did the forward in the book. And uh, we're still friends right to the day. But as far as Tony Dorsett, uh, I didn't read his book. I don't know anything about uh, what he went through down in Dallas because he came in 1977, uh, five years after I left. And Royce Boyles, he's the one that did the research, read the book, and he knows exactly what Dorsett said about uh, facing racism the first time in Dallas and uh, with the Cowboys. So I'm just hoping that not only Dorsett, but Hollywood Henderson or any of the other guys before me during my time and after me, have something to say about what happened to them when they were there playing for the Cowboys. Now, Dave, is it true? Yes. Your first year with the Packers, your your wife was your your wife was not there. Correct. Correct. And uh, and she came my my second year. Uh, Roger Pitts had brought his wife in during the preseason, and she was the only African American woman in town, except for a couple of people came in, go-go dancers primarily. And she couldn't take it. And she went back to Arkansas to, to student teach. The next year, I tried to explain to my wife that none of the black wives were there. And she should stay in New Jersey. And I come up to Green Bay. Her mother told her, said, a woman's place is with her husband. 
And I had to go along with that. And so she came up there with me. Once Fitz saw that my wife had moved in, he brought Ruth up. So Ruth and, Ruth and Elaine, my wife, were really the first Packer black, Packer wise in the city of Green Bay. And what they went through was horrendous. I mean, first of all, they were young, attractive young ladies. And every young black lady in Green Bay at that time, besides them, were usually go-go dancers or prostitutes or something of that, of that sort. And they were, they were approached every time they went downtown by the, by the farmers coming into the city for the first time. <laughs> and some of the things they said were not always what they said, but the way they said it, you know what they said, hello. Because they didn't think they were talking to a pack of wife or someone of some stature. They thought they were talking to a low-life go-go dancer or prostitute or something. And, and, and the, the tone of voice, the, 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 those women came home, both Ruth and, and Elaine came on many days, upset with what they, what they going on downtown. You know, we were recognized downtown, but our wives was a different story. Herb, That's you- one of these why I said that if, if the good Lord's will and I get into the Hall of Fame in February, the thing that I will regret the most is the fact that my wife, who had passed away five years ago, six over six now, she wouldn't be standing there beside me. But she's the one who, in my opinion, was a real all Hall of Famer for what she did, put up with, and always kept her family together. Herb, I can't say enough about her. Herb, you mentioned that you knew Bill Cosby. You grew up with him. There is no character Herb, Ab- Herb Adderley in uh, Fat Albert, is there? <laughs> no, but Fat Albert was a guy that we grew up by the name of Bobby Martin, and uh, he came to Green Bay a couple of times. You remember him, Dave? He was about 350. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he's one of the best kids out there. He grew up in the same neighborhood. If he was that big, you should have had him play football. Well, he did play in high school, but he kept getting heavier and heavier and uh, couldn't hardly carry his weight around. Hey, so, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. So, Herb, <laughs> Herb, was there a guy in the neighborhood who wore like, that uh, ghost mask in the neighborhood? Man, we did all kinds of things in the neighborhood, and mostly uh, <laughs> Bill Cosby's act come from just natural stuff that happened in the neighborhood when we were growing up. Bill Cosby got started. He was a student at Temple University, and they had a uh, stand-up comic contest uh, at a place called the Underground at Broad and uh, Walnut in Philly. And it was underground because you had to go down steps as if you were going down and get the subway, and they had renovated the place. And Bill Cosby was in there just because he wanted to be, uh, he always cracked jokes and being a funny man. And uh, I think the guy's name was Steve Allen. He was doing the Tonight Show at the time. And he just happened to be in there, and he heard Cos in there, and Cos got his break because the guy called him and said, look, why don't you come on the show? And that's when Cosby got started with a stand-up comic act. And uh, Fat Albert is still shown all around the, the world in different languages. Cosby used to play football once upon a time too, right? Cosby was a yeah. four-letter athlete in high school, just like myself. And Ooh. we competed against each other. I went to a different high school. He went to Germantown High School. But we competed against each other in uh, track, uh, basketball, baseball, and we played on the same local basketball team at the Wissick and Boys Club. And it's a picture of us. Uh, Cos was 16, I was 14, and we played on the same team. And it's a picture in our book and uh, points out Cosby and I being friends back in the day. So who's faster, you or Bill Cosby? <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I tell you what, in high school there was four guys, and all of us ran – uh, under a 10 flat 100 yard dash. But there were two guys that could run in the track meet. And I never ran the 100 yard dash my whole time in high school because we had a guy named Angelo Coria who ended up playing in the pros. He ran with the Bears. We had a guy named Bob Brown who went to Penn State. Bob ran a 9 7. And we had a guy named Mike Cooper who ran a 9 8. I was the slowest run, running a 10 flat, 9 9. So, uh, you know, Cosby, he didn't run any sprints. He, he was a high jumper. And uh, broad jump and ran on the relay team, 440 relay. So who was a better basketball player, you or, or Bill Cosby? Hey, I was all city in every sport, and I don't think Cosby was all city in any of the sports. Dave, I'm crazy, but he's a good athlete. He played halfback at Temple too. Played football there. So mm-hmm. who's but, who's got the Mike Ditka stories? Because here in Chicago, Mike Ditka is a Mike Ditka is a legend. Well, well I know he's. He, 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 I played against Mike Ben at Penn State, and Pitt was an arch rival. And, uh, you know, something I heard him say, you may have missed, but he said he went to school because he wanted to get his education. And, and the same thing I did. I went to Penn State for one reason. I want, I want to get an education, and my mother couldn't afford the seminary school. I only played football in college because that's the way I got a scholarship. 
that's the way I think Herb went there. We just want to get an education. We, it it appalls me now when kids are coming out of high school talking about how they're going to, how they're going, what they're going to do with their bonus money when they sign in the National Football League. I never dreamt of playing in the National Football League. Not, not that I thought I was in all of them. I just never had the desire to. I just want to get my degree and get out of school. In my sophomore year, Mike Dicker was an All-American in, and in the fifth Penn State game, I went up against Mike and had a decent game. I didn't, I didn't crush Mike, but but the thing was, Mike didn't crush me. And the next year, Mike was NFL Rookie of the Year, and I said to myself, if he's the best in the NFL. But I can play with those guys, and not until the end of my junior year, after the after the NFL season was over, did I even think about playing in the National Football League. And then I only thought about going there long enough for the one to get married. I needed some money. I thought I'd go in there, and play five years, get vested, and come out. And, and it was, the rest is all history. But that's it. And that and I don't think everybody. Was, I don't know. I'm I'm not putting words in her mouth. But I tell very much he went to college with the idea of going to pro ball. No, I never, you know, thought about that. I'm like you, I was thinking about education. But uh, my senior year at Michigan State, we played Pitt in uh, Pitt Stadium, and Mike Dicker was on that team. Mike Dicker went both ways. He was a great athlete from Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. And I was a running back, like I would mentioned, and Mike Dicker was like a spy. He was playing linebacker and defensive end, depending on where I lined up. And uh, he was hitting me on every play, whether I had the ball or not. So finally, uh, I think it was in the third quarter, uh, I told my man, Fred Arbanis, because he's a great uh, uh, tight end, too. He played for the Kansas City Chiefs. And I told him, I said, look, I said, the next time Dicker does that, I said, I'm, I'm going after him. He said, look, I'm with you. And so Dicker did it one more time, and when he was walking away, I hit him in the back of the head with a, with a, with a mm. forearm, and it started a brawl. Both benches emptied. And Mike Dick mm. and I both got thrown out of that game along with a few other guys, because coaches, everybody was on the field trying to break us up. The game was on national TV my senior year in 1960, and the game ended up in a 7-7 tie. And from that day on, I had no uh, respect or love for Mike Dicker. And when he got with the Bears, it even lessened, because the Bears was, you know, our most hated rival. And uh, Dick and I, we never forgot what happened at Michigan State and Pitt game. And we used to go on after each other when we were playing against each other in the pros. And then when I got traded to Dallas, we ended up being teammates for three years. And obviously, you know, we spoke and uh, never got to be great friends. He never invited me over for dinner. I couldn't tell you his wife's name. He never introduced me to her. So uh, it was no socializing or anything, but we got along, you know, and that's about all I can say about as far as Dick is concerned. You you know, I'll tell you, here's something that's you too. In the... Uh, and Penn State, I led my my sophomore year and went on the basketball team. And the only reason why I led on the basketball team was that Mike Dicker played basketball at the University of Pittsburgh. And Mike Dicker, the first game against Penn State and, and Pittsburgh, he killed, he just dominated under the board. And then our coach at Penn State came, went to our coach, our Rip Angle, who was just before Joe Paterno, and said, Is anybody on your team that plays football ever can play basketball? And two of us. Uh, uh, Don Jones, myself, went out for the, and I think uh, Bill Saw also went out there with the with the basketball team. And the primary reason was he wanted us to stop Dicker under the board who killed him. And so Mike was a and Mike was a great basketball player as well as a football player. And and in fact, I thought when he made All American, he made it as a defensive end. He was a great defensive ball player. And uh, he, he was a well, we had we had to stop because if he lined up on the left side of the ball. And we ran a sweep to our left. He would come down the line hard and catch it from behind, and uh, and uh, and that was his forte. And we we set up plays just to stop Dicker's defensive prowess. And uh, but so Dicker, I just I, I, he's, a, he's a great football player, I tell you. But hey, but like Herb said, he played for the Bears. <laughs> that was it. That was it. And I know Forrest Gray cannot stand Dicker to this day. <laughs> I, think- I know. I was, a lot of guys on that Packer team can't stand <laughs> this day. <laughs> That's right. Now, yeah. now, Dave, after the Packers, yeah. you played for the Redskins, yeah. who, as we've mentioned, historically had a very bad reputation uh, regarding yeah. race. What was it like right. playing for George Allen and being part of the Redskins? It was, by that time, it was entirely different. You know, uh, 
uh, every band of Williams running the team, uh, uh, um, um, George Fester Marshall was who was the fine racist. He admitted being a racist. The one who said that there's not a black man in America good enough to play on his team. He said in 1961, and uh, and that's why when he when he threatened boycotts and everything else in 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 the Washington Stadium, that's why he finally succumbed and went out and drafted Ernie Davis, and then traded Ernie Davis to Cleveland for Bobby Mitchell, who was mm-hmm. the first black to play on that team. Also, there's a rumor that George Howard denied to the day he died. That there was a meeting one time, and George House was there too, where, at where George Preston Marshall told all the owners, this is 1932, he said, white people will not pay to see black people make money playing football. I'll show us how all we, we can all make money if we don't have any blacks in the league. And you check the records, there were plenty of blacks in 1932, but in 1933, there was not a black player on any team in the National Football League, although they all denied that there was such an agreement written. It wasn't written, but was agreed upon. And there were no more until 1946 when the uh, Cleveland Browns uh, and also the, the Los Angeles Rams in the NFL and the Cleveland Browns in the AAFC and the NFL, the Los Angeles Rams, integrated two years before Jackie Robinson. Well, there's really two. There's, there's, there's black, then there was the lily white era from 33 to 46, and then there was the modern era. And, and and it came when it came back around, all those different uh, myths about what black guys could do and couldn't do came around uh, because of Buddy Young. He said black guys can run, can be great runners, but they didn't have the heart to play defense. And then because of Big Daddy Liskin, they said well, they can play defense and not spot up the offense. And then you got guys like Jim Parker, the greatest offensive line I ever saw. And you, you know, and mm-hmm. you got people they said he couldn't play defense. You got Herb Allen, you got Willie Wood. It's amazing, you know. And Willie Wood was a quarterback, a great quarterback at, at USC. But it was no question when he came to the NFL, he was going to play defense. Dave, you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Dave, you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, and I know you're going to go in in 2013. I know you don't want to talk about it, but no, you're going to no. you're going to do it the right way. You're going to say yeah. it's because of what your wife did for you, your teammates, everything yeah. like that. We talked to 81 NFL Hall of Famers, and a lot of them have said some of these guys going in now don't understand what it is to go in the Hall of Fame. One guy in particular, Daryl Green, at his acceptance speech says, yeah. I belong here, I belong here, and that turned yeah, off right, a right. lot of Hall of Famers. Yeah. You know what, I, I you know, I, my real first experience with the Hall of Fame was in 1963, the, the first year, and I, I, talk, I used to have these little quiet conversations with Vince Lombardi, and Vince Lombardi <laughs> was telling me how, how much it meant to go there. But we were but we were the first team to play in the Hall of Fame game. And, and like I said, I, I loved the fan. I honored him. And he thought the Hall of Fame was that important that I thought it was that important. I started watching, and I tell you, I can't even put in words what it would mean to me as a person, as a professional football player, to be in the Hall of Fame. It, it'd be almost as, it, I'd be almost, it, the thrill would be almost as great as I can mention because of the fact that Willie Davis on my right side was there. Herb Alley, who had my back all the time, was there. And, and, there, and uh, and then Ray Nisky, who I worked hand in hand with, is there, and it just goes to say that we feel we had the best left side in the history of the National Football League. And and uh, the only thing is, we we have a Hall of Fame defense in the Hall of Fame corner and Hall of Fame middle linebacker. I think we got to have an outside linebacker in it. But you know, it's kind of funny. All the great linebackers, in fact, Harry Carson said I should go in because LT is in, and he couldn't have done it without me. And Bobby Bell is in, and still is willing in there. But Ray Nisky and Dave Robinson were somebody who was split up. I can never figure that out. <laughs> thank you so much for your time, you guys. Hey, thank you. Thank you for talking to us. No, no problem. And we're going to tell everyone to buy your book, The Left Side. We'll look for Lombardi's Left Side in Canton, Ohio. Right. And every yeah, place. I'll tell you, I tell you it's, a great, it's a great Christmas gift. It's just one super Christmas gift. I think everybody who has read it has told me they can't put it down. They love it. It would be a great Christmas gift and a reasonable, not cheap, just reasonable. <laughs> we'll see you at the Hall of Fame next year. My only request is, right. could, could you get us in the McKinley Grand? Because I had to stay in a Super 8, and I didn't like that hotel. <laughs> we didn't need to on Friday. Ellie, another great show today with Dave Robinson and Herb Adderley. We went one hour. We weren't planning on it, but oh, when two guys... You know, once they got going, all we had to do was just sort of sit here and listen. I mean, I learned about race, about Tom Landry, about Ray Nitschke. Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi. We learned about Lombardi's Left Side, the book that the two gentlemen wrote. I want to thank our producer, Salmon Extraordinaire, Dave Olson. You're listening to Sports and Torts here on TalkZone.com. And tune in again next week for another great show.